We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello, good morning, good afternoon to everyone joining us both virtually and physically here in Katowice. My name is Teki Akuete. I will be moderating this session on One Size Fits None, Creating Digital ID Architecture in Africa. Legal identification is a critical component of our societies today enabling the design and formulation of economic and social policies that bring real value to communities. The value of providing legal identity for all in the area of poverty reduction, education, governance, and health cannot therefore be underestimated. Hence the call under SDG 16.9 for legal identity for all by 2020. It is in line with the importance of IDs that in the past decade, we have seen significant efforts on the continent of Africa to provide legal IDs for all of its citizens. While providing legal IDs is a step to the effective participation in the digital economy, Africa's diversity continues to present challenges to fostering and enabling participation of its citizens in the much touted two trillion market. Today, we will be exploring what it will take to create the right digital ID architecture for Africa, one that responds to its unique needs. In the process, we will also be hearing about the AU interoperability framework for digital IDs, whilst looking at its challenges, opportunities, and the way forward. We have therefore been joined by these eminent panelists virtually who will help us navigate this complex topic. In no uncertain order, I would uh, like to uh, briefly introduce all of them and then bring them on board. We will be joined today by Merit Wood Mattis. She is a digital infrastructure and policy expert who strives to maximize the use of digital technologies and data for Africa's socioeconomic development by minimizing risks. Currently, she is a senior IT expert at the African Union Commission. Merit supports the implementation of Digital Transformation Summit for Africa. We'll also be joined by Jonathan Meskel, who is a senior program officer at the World Bank Group's Cross-Sectional Identification for Development Initiative. He is responsible for leading and supporting financing and technical assistance for countries to build inclusive and trusted ID and civil registration systems across Asia and the Pacific and East and Southern Africa. We'll also be joined by Toby Norman, who is the CEO and founder of Simprints, with a team of more than 35 people working on digital ID projects in Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Kenya, Uganda, Nigeria, and Zambia. Jonathan holds a PhD in management science from the University of Cambridge. We'll also be joined by Robert Karanga, who is the director on responsible technology team at Omedia Network with a specific focus on leading strategic investments that advance the evolution of digital identification, including privacy, uh, user value and control and security. 
Last but not the least, we will also be joined by Gabriela Razzano, who is the Executive Director of Open Up, a civic technology hub in Cape Town, focused on empowering people and government through data, technology, and innovation. Before Open Up, Gabriela worked at Research ICT Africa, where among other things, she led the development of a case study on digital identification ecosystems in South Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. And I'm very excited for the discussions we will be having today. But let me start with you, um, Merit. I would really love it for you to share a bit of an overview on the AU interoperability framework that is currently being developed. Thank you, Merit. Thank you very much, Teki, and greetings from the African Union Commission. And thank you all the participants and the panelists to join uh, this important um, session. As you may uh, be aware, so according to the World Bank report 2018, half of the estimated 1 billion world population that lack any form of legal identification is living in our continent, Africa. This is obviously means that most of our people are not only limited from accessing available social services and then participating in informal political and economic activity, but also as a continent, we are losing a huge opportunity that could have been created through those uh, people without legal identification. This is the Agenda 2063, which is a strategic framework for the socioeconomic development and transformation of the continent, sets a vision of an integrated, prosperous, and peaceful Africa driven by its own citizens, representing a dynamic force in the international arena, has called for a legal identity for all its African citizens and to ensure the realization and of the vision and sustain it. This initiative is also aligned with the SDG 20. 2030 targets, as uh, explained, as uh, mentioned by uh, our moderator. Moreover, the digital transformation strategy for Africa that has been endorsed in the 36th ordinary session of the African Union Executive Council in February 2020 in Addis Ababa also underscored the importance of identity, which is a digital identity, as a building block for the establishment of digital single market in Africa, which is aligned with the African continental free trade area. Knowing the importance of availing the digital ID to their citizens, most of the EU member states are embarking on establishing a modern ID system, most of the digital ID system, that not only help to bridge the digital identity gap, but also help them to reduce the limitations associated with the traditional paper-based system, which is not fit for the digital age. The move to establish a national foundation of digital ID system to provide legal identity for all is a commendable one, as long as the design is based on inclusivity, usability, security, interoperability, at a national continental level, which will make African cross-border trade, employment, travel easier, thereby reducing cost, increase efficiency, and bring economies of scale. Hence, in order to assist member states in their effort and maximize the opportunity provided by the digitalization, and thereby realize the African unity and integrity, the African Union Commission formulated a task force that included representatives from the regional economic communities, the African Development Bank, Smart Africa Secretariat, the African Telecommunication Union, the UNECA, EU, ITU, World Bank, GIZ, and other African institution partners. This is to take advantage of previous continental initiatives and build upon it 
to draft the AU interoperability framework for the digital ID during the second quarter of 2021. The task force came up with the AU interoperability framework for digital ID with a vision that all African citizens can easily and securely access their services they need when they need them from both public and private sector providers, which will encourage inclusive and meaningful participation in the wider digital economy and society and allow services to operate with a gender trust and certainty. It also provides common requirements, including business, technical, operational, and legal requirements as a base for the trust and interoperability within member states, while member states retain full control and choice for design of their national systems and respecting their sovereignty. The draft framework has been reached with inputs received from civil society, academia, and partners through open consultation that has been organized in July 2021. The framework has been also validated by member states, so with uh, commenters and planned to be adopted by January 2020 during the upcoming AU summit. As you can see, the framework is at a very early stage that a, a huge uh, amount of work is uh, ahead. So the challenges uh, so when the vision was set or the task force is formulated, the challenges and the risks that surround, surround the, the realization of this important and critical mission for Africa were also discussed. It actually ranges from the lack of connectivity, electricity, low level of literacy in general and digital in particular, which may further increase the number of African citizens which will be left behind if it is not uh, addressed uh, as soon as possible. The unavailability of secure data centers at the national and the continental level. The absence of technical and legal capacity to ensure privacy, data protection and combat cyber crime as the challenges that we are facing uh, uh, on the way forward. But these challenges, the, I mean, there are proposals to uh, mitigate the challenges. Moreover, these challenges can be solved if there is a political commitment to, our own, to own and drive this important future-oriented approach and uh, based on a win-win partnership and determination from the African uh, community. So this framework is supposed to or plan to be implemented in three phases. The phase one, phase two, phase three. Phase one covers 21, 22. Phase two covers 23, 24. And phase three covers 25 and 30. There are key tasks that need to be covered in phase one. The phase one will be the adoption of uh, the framework where we are now, that is, we expect in January to be adopted. But uh, there are parallel works that need to be done, including the establishment of the legal and regulatory instrument. Uh, the ratification of the Malabo Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal uh, Data Protection, and the nomination of expert groups by AU member states to define further the interoperability and the technical requirements, and the build capacity, and then uh, setting a resource mobilization to build data centers are part of the phase one activities towards realizing this vision in the framework. The the, there are also expectations from member states, that one from the EU side, from member states. We are very much uh, encouraging and supporting for the ratification of particularly the cybersecurity, uh, uh, the Malabo Convention on Cybersecurity, the creation of the enabling legal and regulatory framework, and also other uh, continental uh, signing and ratifying other, adopting other continental frameworks. And then more importantly, launching a strengthening foundational ID system, which is the base for the uh, interoperability digital ID system across the continent. Phase two will uh, move on and uh, actually working on the technical specifications for, uh, for the interoperability and uh, the trust and the governance mechanisms. 
And then once this is done, phase three will continue and then actual implementation of the framework within member states. That's what, what uh, I would say uh, at this point of time and happy to, to answer some of the questions that you may have at this point of the development of the framework. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Merit. That was extremely comprehensive. Um, I just want to move to the other panelists and I will take your reaction uh, to uh, Merit's presentation in three minutes each in no uncertain order. I'm going to start uh, with Gabriela. I'm a bit biased towards the woman. So uh, Gabriela, uh, kindly give me a three minutes reaction to what you think this framework holds and, and what you think about it. Thank you. I thought I was on the end of the list. So, um, no, I mean, well, part of what I was thinking of talking about a little bit about in this context, and it is, it is just understanding the kind of context that these kinds of frameworks are going to be coming in to assist in or embed themselves on top of. Um, and if we think about South Africa, for instance, you know, you have a context of like very, what can essentially, well, maybe I should take a step back and just say that, you know, the different contexts will mean different levels of complexity, but also different kinds of prioritization that need to happen um, in, terms of, in terms of trying to get good ID. Um, available to people. If you look at South Africa, for instance, you have a sort of hodgepodge of foundational identity system that's slowly transitioning to smart identity documents, um, which will include biometric and other data, but also major decentralized identity systems used by the public sector, um, functional identity systems used by the public sector. So for instance, our SOC pen database, which our social pensions database, um, you know, uh, relates to the identities of millions and millions of people who receive uh, life, life preserving social grants through those systems. And then you also have a lot of functional identity systems being driven by the private sector at the same time. And so you have, I think sometimes what we fail to consider, um, and I'll touch on this very briefly, one of the things is that you know, data problems are digital ID problems. So in situations where there are gaps in data governance or challenges in data governance, those will affect the digital identity systems as well. Uh, although to note that, you know, digital identity systems obviously come with their own kinds of risks and opportunities too. The other is that, you know, these the actual technologies themselves are being embedded, well, say in South Africa, but I know in another, a lot of other African countries in, in context with weak, um, weak infrastructure to facilitate um, digital identity systems, which often means a heavy reliance on the private sector, both to build infrastructure, um, but also to deliver on services. This, this relationship can sometimes be unproductive, sometimes it can be very productive. Um, but, you know, and I think that brings in an interesting counter, which is that in many ways, transparency and improving transparency um, and good governance frameworks more broadly becomes an enabler for um, actually mitigating some of the privacy risks um, that come with these technologies. And what I'm thinking about there is, you know, a number of times that relationships between the, uh, in South Africa, where relationships between the public sector and the private sector have led to collusion, um, improper projects, um, and all those kinds of things. So, yeah, I mean, I suppose my comment in brief is that, you know, there are a lot of diverge systems that need to be considered. Um, and so how frameworks can support, a, you know, um, particular domestic context is all, always the challenging part, um, which I'm sure you know. And also just to sound the bell of, of aligning some of the data governance conversations with the digital identity conversations, which I think I, I know actually already happens. Um, that's me. 
Thank you so much, Gabriela. In my world, the last shall become the first. So, um, <laughs> um, uh, Robert, I, I just want to uh, come to you. Uh, but before then, uh, those in the room, if you have your questions, uh, let's get it ready, as well as those in the audience. You can just put your questions in the chat. I believe it's being monitored and it will be shared with us shortly. Uh, Robert, what, what is your reaction to all of this, especially looking at the work that you're doing on the continent. Thank you very much, Teki. I was very much looking forward to joining your world and the last shall be first, but uh, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I guess what I'd like to say is I, I'm really encouraged by, by what um, Mirit put forward in terms of the work that uh, the African Union is doing around the interoperability framework, because that is, very much in line with our hypothesis as a media that has guided our investments across the continent. And you know the key hypothesis um, that she touched on that I'd like to just briefly discuss is we are very much looking at you know influencing um, governments across the continent through norms and multilaterals by investing in multilateral organizations. And so we've done that by um, working closely with our partners at UNECA, um, Smart Africa, and also the World Bank's ID4D, um, Jonathan's team. And with the intent that we continue to, to strengthen um, that good ID framework through working with those multilaterals, then we can also continue to push for key safeguards and technical solutions, um, such as MOSIP, which Omedia has also invested in, as as a private investment, um, the modular open source platform on which we, we do hope that a lot of national um, foundational IDs will be built. Uh, MOSIP has rolled out in the Philippines and is in several discussions um, across the continent to, to roll out national foundation, foundational ID systems um, across the continent. And again, we, we do also hope that as the AUC and other multilateral organizations continue to work across the continent that will see a shift you know, among African countries, um, not only shifting to, to new standard issued ID systems, but they will also have the capacity and the incentives to implement policies that are aligned with the principles of good ID. Um, of course, over the last few years, several African governments have uh, set up data protection um, offices. And, and I think that's really a good start in terms of not only setting up that framework, uh, for data protection authorities, but also ensuring that those DPAs are independent. And I think the key word here being independent because um, it's one thing to set up a DPA, but if the DPA is not allowed to, to go about their business in an independent manner and there's interference from other sources, then that is almost counterintuitive against um, what the Good ID Framework would look like. So just in conclusion to say that you know, the work that the AUC is doing and other multilaterals across the continent is very much in line with our hypothesis and has influenced our investment decisions um, across the continent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, Toby, let me come to you. You have worked in at least I'm seeing four African countries. And so you're very much aware of, of the diversity that even exists in, in this um, ecosystem. How do you think, you know, the framework as explained by Merit is, is really going to help us navigate this, this challenging environment for Africa? Yeah, that's a great question. And I echo Robert's enthusiasm. And I think I'm very encouraged listening to and learning more about this framework. And I think where it's going to help is it's going to help us manage really some very complex and large scale digital ID programming, particularly ones that I, and I pull out three trends in particular that are landing at the same time. But the first one Robert touched on briefly, which is the trend we see towards open source digital ID tools, both in the foundational and the functional world. So for example, in the foundational side, tools like MOSIT, and in the functional side, the huge adoption we've seen over the past five years or so of some of the functional um, use of identity, things like DHS2, for example, which is used in healthcare, 
and healthcare delivery. We're seeing national scale now that's just across the African subcontinent, which is really exciting. I think 33 different countries used DHS2 for COVID vaccine delivery registries. And so I think we're going to see a lot more towards that. The UN itself is endorsing this push towards digital public goods. The second one that's super important, of course, very close to my heart and our work, um, is use of biometrics, the safe and responsible use of biometrics. This can bring a lot of advantages, both in terms of the accuracy, the reliability, and the uniqueness of data in some of these digital ID systems. But this is also highly sensitive data, right? And it has a lot of risks if used badly. For example, if you looked at what happened with Afghanistan with the large amount of biometric devices that were left and then used by the Taliban, we should be really concerned about this. And while I think that there's a number of technical solutions that are promising, for example, things like biometric revocability, homomorphic encryption, some of the new stuff that, that's coming out of that edge, we should be really concerned that if we don't have on the through the frameworks, but also on the local legal privacy around a truly independent um, data protection, we're going to have big problems here in the future. And so this is one of the areas that we're really concerned about and a trend that I think is hitting because we're seeing biometrics adopted more and more across programming, both for functional and foundational ID. The final one, and I pull out as a sign of encouragement, but also a place that we've got a lot of work to do is from, you know, excellent framework that Mirror and team contributing towards, we've got a lot more applied experience now in terms of rolling out both foundational and functional identity programs. But I still think there's going to be a huge gap between aspiration and reality if we don't concentrate and support some of the technical assistance that's required to make this happen. You know, we've done, for example, a lot of frontline programming with Gavi using biometric digital IDs for vaccine rollout campaigns. One of the big challenges we see is just the applied requirements. If you imagine like a health worker or a national government worker as part of a national registration you know, in a frontline context, trying to actually take and give either a national foundational or a functional ID for service delivery, there's a huge number of challenges that we've got to grapple with from the truly informed consent, for example, with folks who maybe don't have huge amounts um, of education based on where they are in their life, to the technical challenges for some of these systems, while still exciting, you know, those big infrastructure gaps we've got to grapple with, to then the interoperability, making that not just theoretically, but actually doing that in practice. Do we have interoperability testing as part of the rollouts of some of these digital ID initiatives so we can prove before we let the vendor walk away but that is genuinely baked into the program. And so I think those are three of the trends I see that are probably going to be influencing the way we actually see um, the excellent work that's happening on the framework rolled out. Thank you very much. Um, Jonathan, um, I'm just coming to you. Yes, the, the idea of the framework is exciting, but um, what are your reactions there and based on your experience and also exposure to the African space, um, what do you think may be some of the challenges and how can we navigate this? Hey, thank you so much, Teki, and, and hello, everyone. Um, let me start just by commending the African Union Commission for um, driving this process ahead um, because it hasn't been easy. The, there's been tight timelines, but it's also been a process that's featured a lot of consultation and the output, the actual framework document itself, which hopefully will be published soon, is, is in a very good shape. Um, the first reaction that I would have is um, this feels a necessary, um, it feels a, a key void um, in creating a normative framework for digital ID uh, in Africa. Of course, there's some global standards. Um, it, this, there's not standards that cover everything, uh, but there are some standards ex that exist, but these um, are very, uh, these are developed, frankly, by high income advanced economies. Um, and some of these standards, for example, around passports, um, introduce a lot of cost and, and don't take into account um, unique circumstances of, of African countries and, and the same uh, to be honest, in, in parts of Asia as well. Um, and on the continent, there's been a huge uh, initiative around civil registration and vital statistics. Um, there's been a lot of work around payments, um, uh, data a little bit as well. 
Um, but our digital identity has kind of um, uh, uh, remained a gap. Um, and so creating a, a, a normative framework on, on inclusion, on, on data protection, um, on interoperability um, is, is a very important step because as Mirette said, um, uh, the, a lot of African countries, if not the majority, are either rolling out new ID systems or, or modernizing existing ones. So the time to get these norms out um, uh, is, is, uh, is, is right now. The second point I want to make is that, um, and I love the title of this session, which is um, uh, One Size Fits None, um, because that's the reality of this agenda. Every country is going to have a different um, ID system in terms of the data, in terms of the credentials, in terms of the processes, in terms of the institutional arrangements. Um, and so creating a framework that, that encompasses all African Union member states is, is very difficult. But what the framework has done very well is, is not interfere with the national sovereignty of countries to design their ID systems as they want, but to create a layer on top that facilitates cross-border cross, cross -border interoperability and mutual recognition. And to do so in such a way that is um, uh, technologically uh, neutral, techn technology neutral, uh, vendor neutral, but also takes advantage of emerging standards like, for example, verifiable credentials. Um, and this is going to position the continent very well as the digital economy grows even faster and, and even more, as more and more people will want to do transactions online. Um, to be honest, the use cases there for um, cross-border digital ID in Africa, there's not many, there are some, um, but this is going to change um, as, um, as economies grow and there's more e-commerce, um, more cross-border payments, um, more opportunities for trade that will cre um, create because of the AFCFTA, um, creating opportunities for you know opening businesses in other countries, and and um, and this framework will help uh, people do that. It will promote uh, trade in Africa. It will promote social uh, integration as well. Uh, finally, in terms of challenges, Teki, your question. Um, I think the, the the major challenges first and foremost. The framework is just, um, it's high level now and it will need to be translated into details. Um, I think uh, the, that process will need to start in earnest after hopefully the framework is endorsed by the, the heads of state. Um, that process is gonna be complicated, negotiating um, the different interests between uh, 50 plus countries. Um, second, at the national level, I think the coordination between different stakeholders. Um, because ID is such a cross-sectoral uh, issue, but there are ID agencies in countries, typically a Ministry of Home Affairs or Interior, but increasingly also ministries of ICT, um, to ensure that all stakeholders in countries um, are consulted uh, with um, and buy in and, and own this process. And then finally, in terms of the, um, the ability of countries to, to implement, this requires capacity. It also requires digital public goods. Uh, Robert mentioned some of the great work Amidiar is doing, for example, investing in MOSIP, um, but, but um, in, in a, there's other digital public goods um, that will hopefully support this framework in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. If, um, if there are any questions in the room, um, I'll kindly ask you to come forward if there are questions. Um, meanwhile, I just have a few questions that I, I want to ask. And Mirad, I'm, I'm gonna start with you since you are you know, at the implementing helm of, of this challenge. Uh, what do you see as the potential hope and, and fears that you have for, for this framework and how are you planning to navigate that? Um, thank you very much, Teki, for this very important question. The potential hope is that as an African, uh, we have to step up and take part in this digital economy. So we don't have to lose this opportunity. We need to maximize whatever opportunity we get from this digitalization or from the fourth industrial, uh, industrialization to, to separate Africa from all those um, associated expressions. So the digital ID or the framework 
will give us the opportunity, especially the interoperability for Africans to cross borders freely, to exchange data, to do business. This unlock a huge opportunity for us. So this enables, as the digital ID enables, this initiative, I believe, will be welcomed by most members, all member states, if I may see. So I have a big hope that this will be, it, 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 it should have a positive a prospect. But my fear is, we know where we are in terms of digital infrastructure. We know our internet penetration is not even reached thirty percent. We know our digital literacy level. We know the investments that we made to secure our key infrastructures, including our data. So, if we are not able to work to bridge those gaps, then realizing the framework uh, will remain a vision. So that is in a nutshell what I would like to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I, I think that just brings me to the next question that I'm really itching to ask um, all our other panelists to maybe briefly react to it. How do you think we can overcome the entrenched offline inequalities with civil registration systems around the digital interventions like digital ID? Can we even do this at all? And, and is digital necessarily better than what we currently have? I'm gonna start uh, with you, Gabriela, and then Robert and, and Jonathan and Toby. So kindly react to that for me. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the most important rallying calls is, you know, in our context is, is how, um, how much both digital transformation and digital services are marked by inequalities and, and the reality of inequalities on the ground, you know, and I think you can't answer questions on improved digital identity with uh, first answering those really traditional questions on how to expand infrastructure in a way that's equi equitable and practical and cost efficient, which necessarily in our context means, uh, um, you know, different kinds of, of public po private partnerships to pick up those those gaps, those infrastructure gaps that still exist. Um, uh, but I think yeah, I don't always know that digital is better. We, you know, a lot of our technology solutions are very much focused on low tech approaches, um, given connectivity, given data costs and all these things. And, you know, I think the priority needs to be the problem solving. So how do you solve this problem for people in a way, in a way that's equitable? Um, and, you know, in many ways, there are two risks to digital identity system. I mean, you know, we can talk about risks. Uh, Henri would talk very well about risks and the manifestations of risks. But, you know, there is the risk of being excluded from systems that actually give you access to fundamental services. And I think sometimes we don't. When we're talking about context, I think it's sometimes underappreciated how central digital identity will become to accessing life-preserving services for many people. And that risk is huge. That risk of exclusion is, is gigantic. I mean, when you consider in South Africa that 13 million people uh, get, get social grants, for instance, that, that kind of thing. Um, but at the same time, I think there's the risk of inclusions in systems, inclusion without representation. You know, so how do you how do you manifest participation in in these the, not just the rollout of these systems, but in the development of these systems? Um, and I think we need to think very creatively about how to do that before we even think of what what to do with the technology. Um, yep, that's my Thank answer you. in brief. Thank you very much, Robert. On on the inequalities. Okay. 
Thanks, thanks, Teki. Um, I, I just wanted to perhaps respond to your question in two ways. One, looking at the political will, um, you know, of uh, governments in the region to to advance um, inclusion within their within their society, um, and to also consider the fact that if if I think about the East African community, for example. Um, we we tend to have quite a fragile environment, and we do have Kenya, for example, at any one time, maybe hosts two to maybe three million um, refugees at any one time, including stateless individuals. And how do we consider these individuals to provide them with an equal opportunity to education, healthcare? social services, you know, what, what, what systems are in place and is there the political will to do so? And, and when I look back to the early days of the East Africa community, which is often touted as perhaps the most advanced um, regional economic body across the continent, it's still nascent in terms of, we've got a secretariat in Arusha that should be independent and should be able to operate um, beyond any political interference. And we've got a customs union in place that essentially says that if you're a citizen of any of the ESC countries, you can travel across borders with only a national identity card, if available. Not all countries within the ESC have a, a national identity. Um, Kenya has had one for a long time that is drawn down from pre-colonial um, and what was initially called the Kipande was then adopted as the national ID. Uh, Tanzania, for example, has not had a national identity. And, um, you know, the customs union, of course, does propose that they would look at setting up a foundational national ID system before we even talk about our digital ID system. Mm. But again, the customs union does say that there should be an interrupted movement of capital goods and people across borders, but the political will has not been always there. And, and I think that can be a hindrance to even um, interoperability of digital ID systems if uh, we cannot um, have a system in place that allows uh, even a basic customs union to be implemented. And, and, and so I think those are some of the challenges that we do need to work through. And, and hopefully the multilaterals through their convening power will be able to, to influence national governments to move in that direction in a positive way. Thank All you. Right. Thank you very much. Um, Jonathan, in two minutes, please. And then I'll come to you, Toby, yeah. Well, sure, thanks. Um, I'll try and answer um, the questions in two parts. First, regarding is, is digital better or inevitable? Um, the reality is that these technologies have been um, uh, invented and, and rolled out and innovated to address problems. Um, and if you think about paper records, my family is from the Soviet Union, the records are lost. And the Soviet Union was very good at keeping records when it comes to birth records, marriage records, et cetera. Um, physical or paper records, they're easy to forge, they're easy to lose, they get destroyed in conflicts, especially. I'm, I've worked in a number of countries who have lost all their civil registration records because of civil conflict. Um, it's, you have, it's hard to transport them, it's expensive to, to archive them, et cetera. So it's, it's not, if we, yes, there are risks with digitalization, but um, the, count, the, the counterfactual uh, is, is not as good. And I think the, the intention then should be to ensure that when these technologies are applied, when these solutions are applied, that they are done so in ways that are, that are appropriate for the context. Um, something that works in Estonia is not going to work in the Central African Republic, for example. Um, so I think that's where we need to be more deliberate. Um, the digital public goods that are, that are more appropriate for developing country contexts, um, solutions that work offline and online is very important, but also always maintaining uh, manual or analog alternatives, whether it's for those people who cannot access digital means or for those, or for when the digital systems go down, which they inevitably do. On the question about civil registration, uh, very briefly, um, it's not a zero sum game between digital ID and civil registration. Unfortunately, some like to frame it like that, but that's not the reality. 
I think um, the, what, what's happening is that countries um, and ministries of finance in particular, they have limited resources and they need to decide where would they get the largest return on investment. A birth certificate is extremely important um, for that child's future, for um, enshrining their, their legal identity, but will it improve uh, government to person payments? Will it improve financial inclusion? Will it improve digital government? Not necessarily. And so there's a need for a stronger investment case for civil registration. And what we find in our experience is one of the best arguments yeah. is if you get a good civil registration in place, capturing all the births and deaths, that makes your national ID or your foundational ID system better and more efficient. And that's a very good argument. And it shows that they're actually mutually beneficial. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, Toby, last but not the least. <laughs> Just build on two big risks. I see the first gap we mentioned that that risk to exclusion. So, for example, we still see fingerprints as one of the most commonly used biometric modalities in these digital ID programs across Africa. When I was a researcher at the University of Cambridge, we did a study with over 135,000 different fingerprints, mostly from the really rural and low income populations. And saw so huge loads of scar damage, and particularly with women, burned fingerprints from, from lifting. Um, hot cooking pots over open fires, which meant that the damage meant that they were often unreadable and had a much, much higher risk of false rejection from some of the existing digital ID systems. And so the fear is that if we, and these are solvable problems, but I think one very genuine fear is that if we don't know about them and we don't design practically in mind for solving them, there's a risk people get excluded from social benefits or cash transfers or whatever the intervention is enabled through digital ID if we're not really thoughtful about that, if, if we're not looking for the right solutions. The second risk, I think, is the will to go up the tough part of the adoption curve through the disillusionment cycle and up into a place where I think digital ID can bring a lot of benefit. I remember being in, in a few years ago and speaking to folks within the Ministry of Health and they're asking, why is it that I, every every month, get reports saying we vaccinated more than 130% of my districts, but every year I get vaccine-preventable epidemics breaking out in these districts? And so I definitely believe the future is digital, and one of the huge benefits we can get from the work that people are doing here on digital ID can be really get accurate precision, real-time data about who we're reaching and who we're not reaching with some very life-saving interventions. I'm really excited about that. But we need to know that as that data becomes more accurate, in many cases, it's going to drive what looks like the, the big picture numbers down because it's getting more accurate. And so there's a risk that I think people will see that decrease as we get the accuracy, and then we'll start to lack or lose the political and investment will to go through this whole cycle and see some of the benefits from the digital side. And if we're not conscious about what a long journey it's going to be in this while of the framework, where we're going to lose that, we risk losing that will along the way. Thank you very much, Toby. We have a question from the floor here in Katowice, so I just hand over to you to ask your question, sir. Um, hello. Uh, thank you so much for your nice and interesting conversation. I think the African uh, identity program would be one of the uh, be, uh, most uh, famous and interesting uh, best practices in all over the world in near future. But I have two questions. Uh, for, the first question is that, as you told, uh, there's a relationship between uh, uh, this digital transformation program in Africa and the uh, identity program. I want to know exactly what's the uh, relationship between these two, because as you know, digital transformation in national level uh, consists of uh, lots of different uh, projects in government, in uh, actually uh, different enterprises, in private sectors, and so on. I want to know what's exactly the, uh, the relationship uh, and the coherency between these two. Uh, do you uh, view the identity as one of the digital transformation projects, or they are uh, completely different? The, the second question, uh, is that, as we know, uh, I, uh, developing an identity program in, uh, in countries is a sovereign and national decision, actually. And uh, as we know, in Africa, um, um, the World Bank uh, has a lot of uh, um, 
significant, significant uh, and effective uh, uh, role in developing a national uh, ID program. Uh, what's the, uh, the role of uh, cyber security strategies and uh, sovereignty viewpoints of Afri Africa in this regard. As we know, the, each country has their own uh, actually context and uh, cultural, social, and other uh, factors. But uh, um, in, in, in a so sovereignty viewpoint, what's the Africa points in developing the uh, identity program? Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Um, so I'll come, I think, Mirat, I'll give you the opportunity to react to the uh, questions that have been asked. And then maybe I'll ask one or two of the other panelists to just give an intervention on it. Thank you very much, Tiki, and thank you very much for the, uh, the question. So let me go to first the relationship between the digital transformation and the uh, digital ID. The digital transformation strategy for Africa has identified uh, pillars and enabling five cross-cutting themes and guide seven guiding pre uh, principles, then and critical sectors that needs to be addressed or uh, dealt with in order to realize the digital transformation by 2030. So among these five cross-cutting themes uh, to realize a digital transformation in Africa, digital ID is one of, uh, one of them. So maybe five of them, one is content and application, the second is digital ID, the third is emerging technologies, the fourth is cross, uh, cyber security and personal data protection, and the fifth is research and development. These are the... Uh, five cross-cutting themes that is identified for the realization of digital transformation strategy for Africa. So that's the relation is very direct. It is one of the cross-cutting terms. And then the others, we have five, six critical sectors. This is the digital governance, digital agriculture, digital education, digital trade and financial services, digital industry, digital health are the critical sectors as well. And then if we move forward and then they say it's the digital transformation strategy also set as an objective like to realize the digital single market in Africa by 2030. In order to realize the digital single market in Africa, uh, it also sets a target to avail digital ID for African 99.9% of African citizens to have a digital ID but by 2030. And then this is also related with the African, uh, the, the African uh, continental free trade area. So if I, I'm not sure if I answer your question about the relationship between uh, the, the digital strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Merit. I'm really looking at our time and thinking that you have really digested it. I see a question, uh, Malet, I believe there's a question um, on online. So uh, can we have that question? And then I will use that. We have our last nine minutes. We'll use all the panelists' reaction to it as their closing remarks, and then we can close on time. Malet, uh, I believe there's a question. Yeah, thank you. Yes, there is one question for all panelists. It says, in his opening address to the IGF yesterday, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres noted that the pandemic has magnified the digital divide and the dark side of technology. How do we address or mitigate the dark side of digital identities if there is one? Thank you very much. So um, I will start again with you, Gabriela, and then we will move through the same format we started before, and then I'll end with merit. It's a healthy bias. So I'm very <laughs> happy with it. <laughs> now, I was going to say, you know, we talked a little bit about different kinds of exclusion and inclusion risks and all those things. Um, but I really do believe that part of the risks in being left behind is the idea that, you know, on the continent, we're the subjects of technology and not the creators and innovators of technology. And I think there are a lot of solutions. Um, there are a lot of risks that can be made actually by facilitating local innovation, um, which is in 
exclusionary in the populations that it, it seeks to subject, you know. Um, and I really think that's an important um, an important driving force for for practically dealing with some of these risks. Thank you, um, Robert. Sure, thanks, Tiki. Um, I agree with the with the first uh, question that uh, the implementation of ID systems is the sovereignty of uh, is tied into the sovereignty of governments. And I think one missing equation that we probably have not discussed um, in detail is the fact that um, who then holds governments accountable. And in that case, civil society also has to be strengthened across the continent, has to be empowered and provided also with the technical knowledge to be able to, to hold their governments accountable, especially when it comes to issues around design, policy, um, inclusion, and all the specific norms and practices that we would expect from a good ID system. So I think it's very important that as, as we look to government on one hand to, to implement these systems, we are also strengthening the other hand, which is um, civil society actors to be able to hold their governments accountable, even as they roll out ID systems. Thank you. Thank you. Toby? Just end with, like any technical wave, digital identity has a ton of promise and a ton of risks. You look at the way that digital identity is used today in China versus the way that it's used, for example, in Ghana, there are huge differences in how these technologies, but also the associated systems are used. My encouragement is I think that push towards self-sovereignty, you know, the individual owning, controlling, and having choice over how that digital identity is used, I see is a very positive trend. A number of partners we work with in our coach, if we keep pushing in that direction, a lot of the risks we'll be able to manage because people are going to have own and control their own identity. Thank you. That was right on. Jonathan? Thanks. I, I agree with everything the, the other panelists have, have said. And, and I guess just to answer the question uh, on how to address the, the dark side, and there is a dark side, um, there's the 10 principles on ID for sustainable development. They've been endorsed by 30 organizations, including Omidia um, and, and many UN agencies, African Development Bank, et cetera. Um, I think the, the answer more or less at a high level, at least, uh, it, it lies there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Merit, how do we address the, uh, the dark sides to all this? Um, so in my view, uh, we just have to uh, understand the dark side in the first place and try to address that dark side uh, um, based on, uh, so based on the level, the capability, the opportunity and the challenge in many sides, we can see it in, in different sides. But the first thing is we have to be very clear, very clear what is that dark side and then how we are going to address it would be coming. So it's very difficult, difficult to, to give immediate answer for that. But my take in there is to know the dark side and find a solution to address the dark side. Understanding the problem first comes first. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Merit. And on that note, I just want to say thank you to all our panelists and audience, both online and in the room here in Katowice. Um, I think going back, today happens to be exactly 63 years when the first president of Ghana, uh, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, called a meeting in Ghana on African unity. And I just want to reiterate a statement that he made, which I think is even more important today. And one of the things he said in this opening speech at the conference was the fact that Africans should be open to adopting what works and adapting what works and rejecting what will not work for us. And I think that is, you know, a big takeaway for us on, on, on the importance of digital ID for the continent. Clearly, it is a building block to participation in the digital economy. And if our people are going to make the most 
of the digital economy, then we have to ensure that they are equipped and able to participate. At the same time, we must recognize our unique difference and the ecosystem in which we exist and the possibility of exclusion of the most important people that matter on our continent. And so whatever we look at, whatever efforts as we have had here today, must look at mitigating and minimizing, and maybe to choose the words of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, rejecting uh, the risks that some of these processes will pose for our people. But overall, um, I believe that the future is bright. It has come out clearly that there is a lot of work that has to be done. The framework is a good step, but clearly as identified by the AU itself, it's just the first step in the right direction. And there are many, many more steps that we will have to undertake in order to ensure that this works for all of us, for our countries and for all the people on the continent. Interoperability will create uh, the, the enabling platform that we need for everyone to participate. But in doing that as well, we must look at technologies, the adoption of technologies that can facilitate this. We must also look at the adoption of policies that will strengthen good ID frameworks in order to achieve this. And on that note, I just want to once again say thank you to everyone, especially those of you joining us from elsewhere and those that came to join us here in the room. Um, I appreciate having you here this afternoon. Thank you. And we'll meet again sometime soon.